Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. Hey everyone, welcome back to our series on key battles in the Revolutionary War. In the last episode, we looked at Lexington and Concord, which were battles in the technical sense, but they were kind of like the strike on Japan after Pearl Harbor, the Doolittle Raid. It's much more of symbolic value than it is of significant troop loss of life and of significant strategic battle. We're going to take a little detour here to look at what American troops were actually up against with British soldiers. And also, what was a Continental soldier look like? And we have images of them. Maybe we've seen the Patriot movie that is very liberal with the historical record. We'll see what's happening or what isn't happening. Have you seen the Patriot, James? What do you think about that film? Oh, I've seen it several times. And, you know, I think it's actually more accurate than it gets credit for. And... Michael Troy believes the same thing. He and I had a discussion about it once. I guess we don't need to go into a lot of detail about that. But um, I I have seen a lot of the criticisms leveled at it, and some of them seem to me to be kind of petty. Yeah. Uh, Kind of, you know, like they purposely changed the name of the bad guy in, in real life, he's based on a person named Bannister Tarleton, who we'll talk about uh, further on down the road. They changed his name to Taviston. And and one person who was critical of the movie said, well, at least get his name right. And I was thinking, <laughs> well, that was the whole point. Duh, they changed it on purpose. So, right. Uh, I mean, I don't think the British probably burned down any churches with people in the church, but they burned a lot of stuff. They And they were – not nice. Sometimes they were pretty cruel. They treated, and that guy in particular, Bannister Tarleton, we'll talk about him later, but he was nicknamed Ban the Butcher or Bloody Ban. And uh, so anyway, yeah, so I, I think it's uh, it's not intended to be super accurate. I mean, it's loosely based on the life of Francis Marion, but I think it gets a lot right too. Bloody Ban, Ban the Man. Well, one thing that I thought of, uh, and I think we'll mention this in this episode, is that cannonballs weren't incendiary. They didn't explode on impact. They would just hurtle at massive velocity. And they show that in the Patriot in a battle scene where there's a cannonball that's fired. You see it bounce on the ground. It's rolling. At one hand, you think, oh, it's a dud. But then it knocks off somebody's limbs. And I imagine that would happen if essentially a bowling ball were coming at you at three or 400 miles per hour. That wouldn't be too much fun if it hit you. No, it would not be fun at all. They did have some explosive ordnance, but uh, I think just plain old cannonballs were the bread and butter. Let's look at this and see what actual soldiers were like. First of all, I think you have a quote from uh, the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon that uh, I was surprised to read because it was sort of assumed, or at least I thought that the British soldiers were the imperial superpower. But what did others think of British soldiers? Well, Wellington himself said, Our army, this is a quote, our army is composed of the scum of the earth, the mere scum of the earth. He also said they enlisted, quote, from having got bastard children, some from minor offenses, many more for drink. (laughs) I don't have the rest of the quote here, but he also said that, but there was no, no one he'd rather lead into battle. In other words, they were low lives, but once you got them into battle, they were really good. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know why I didn't put that down, but I remember that Napoleon said the British army was, quote, an army of lions commanded by jackasses. (laughs) So so he had a Napoleon thought pretty well of the average soldier, but apparently not very well of the officers. So let's investigate whether this was true or not. Let's let's get beyond the quotes and the movies and the stereotypes and let's see. And I want to give a shout out to a lecture series I listened to by Dr. Alan Gelzo. He is a scholar of the revolution and the civil war and early American history at Gettysburg college. It's, that'd be a great place to be if you're a history professor. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, he did a, uh, course for the teaching company, which we've mentioned in previous series called the the American revolution. And I think it was, uh, 24 or 36 lectures. I can't remember which, but I recommend it for people who want to dig a little deeper than we're going to be going. But, 
So I'm really heavily depending on him for this particular information. I got most of it from his lecture. So the average British soldier, uh, to the extent that you can have an average one, let's just say like the typical British soldier would have been in his lower 20s, probably 23 on average, about five foot six in height, so not very tall. The most common so background of a soldier in the British Army was a farmer. And also there were some weavers, there were shoemakers, there were other types of craftsmen, but mainly farmers. And most of them had joined voluntarily. But there were a few that had been forced into the army by press gangs. Although I've I've I was actually just listening to a podcast on this yesterday on this subject by a, another scholar, and I can't remember who it is, can't remember his name, but he said it was all volunteer, or almost all volunteer. So, so don't think that there were too many that had been forced into the army or drafted. They didn't really have a draft in the sense that we think of today. Why did people join the army? Well, a lot of them just wanted a job. They were out of work. Others wanted to get out of their boring farm lives. Others joined in order to avoid death sentences or prison. So they were given the option, yeah, die be hung or go into the army. Well, the, gee, the army sounds pretty good if you put it that way. <laughs> it's like the French Foreign Legion, except it's the main national army. It's great. Yeah, and there were others that were tricked into enlisting. So I've I've read and heard stories of uh, and a recruiters going around and buying somebody a drink and then another drink and another drink <laughs> and before and the guy would wake up, passed out. He would pass out and wake up and realize, oh, I'm in the army now. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hey, whatever it takes. But it sounds like, you know, from what I've been able to ascertain, most signed up on their own will. But again, I'm not sure that they would do it, all things being equal. A lot of them just needed a three square meals a day and a good, a, a good regular paycheck. Uh, most of them were Scottish or Irish. I think we touched on this a little last time. People from actual England, England proper, they only made up 30% of the army. So that's very interesting. Hmm. I think it makes sense because I think the Irish were poorer than the English at this point, and, and the Scots were, especially the Highlanders. Um, most of them could not read and write, at least among the enlisted men. We're talking about the enlisted men now. We'll talk about officers in a little bit. Um, so most of them could not read and write. Only about a third were able to read and write. Now, most of them received an enlistment bonus equivalent to $100, $100 uh, U.S. dollars today. You know, so, nice little chunk of change. A lot of them, it was probably more money than they'd ever seen before. By the end of the war, it rose to the equivalent of $800 today. So, that's, you know, that's pretty good pretty good little signing bonus there. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not if, that's not like if you were a football player or something, <laughs> but still... Hey, sounds good. They were paid only eight pence a day, and I don't have the modern equivalent of that, but it wouldn't be a whole lot. But it worked out to be even less because they had to pay for their uniform and their equipment. That's kind of a ripoff, although, I mean, that's still true in the Army today, in the U.S. Army. So they actually received, once all their expenses were deducted, they received much less. And some even took extra jobs on the side. This was a source of tension between the residents of Boston and the soldiers that were sent there in 1768, which eventually led to the Boston Massacre in 1770. We talked about that in a previous episode. But part of the reason the colonists or the people of Boston hated the soldiers so much is because soldiers were taking jobs that they felt were the people of Boston should have had instead. So. So, yeah, they, I mean, it's like it's pretty bad when you're in the army and then you still have to have a job on the side, too, just to make ends meet. Yeah, I wonder, once your patrol is over, do you hang up your uniform and then duck into your candle shop and start dipping candles and selling them to Bostonians or well, <laughs> wonder yeah, what or this looks like? Making rope. Or th there's this famous story about a guy that went into a soldier that went up to a rope maker and said, uh, do you have any work for me? And the guy said, you can empty my <laughs> my chamber pot basically that he actually used the word of an, a, a vulgar word which i won't use this is a family friendly podcast but anyway uh so yeah that caused problems okay well uh one question i have in general now the british empire is a global empire at this time they have their holdings in the new world of course in india they're slowly beginning their push into Africa, which will intensify in the 19th century. Do they have a large standing army? I mean, I know they have to some extent, but 
do they rapidly throttle up and down if there's a major war going on? Do they typically always have a large troop contingent and they just add to it if they need more troops? Or what does that look like? Well, they they tried to keep the army as small as possible because the army costs money. And keep in mind that the British government was in big debt still from the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War, as they called it in Europe. So they it's not like they just kept a massive army all the time like like the U.S. does today. Um, but they, they did have a significantly sized standing army, but they did have to beef it up whenever a major war popped up like this one, for example. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, this it's an interesting because we've talked about this as a transition point between the Middle Ages when there's no standing army at all. There are knights that are trained, but then you have to completely field it from almost nothing when a war breaks out versus today when you do have large standing one. Just to put it in perspective, let me say one more thing. I, I, I took another note that I didn't put in our show notes, but about 50,000 total British soldiers served in the American Revolution. Again, I just just heard this on a podcast. It's called Ben Franklin's World. You've probably heard of it. Really good podcast about 18th century America. But um, so about 50,000, give or take 20 percent. That's a pretty wide range. They didn't really keep super strict records, so it's hard to say the total number. But about 50,000, give or take uh, 10,000. <laughs> so but let's say between 40 and 60,000 served in the American Revolution. And of those, about 5,000 deserted. We will see this later, but many British soldiers just tried their luck with running away and starting a new life in America although the penalties were very severe. Yeah, so what was the organization like for the British Army? Okay, so the basic unit was the regiment. The regiment was in the several hundred, it would be 600 to 1,000 range. It was the highest official unit, although regiments were sometimes grouped together into brigades of bigger units, which would have three or four regiments on an ad hoc basis. Each regiment had its own number to identify it. Many had a history, like a long history going way back, and there were a lot there was a lot of regimental pride. You know, it's kind of like in the US Army, we have the, the 101st Airborne, which has a great history. Uh, the 82nd Airborne, you know, the, the first division, the big red one, and so on. Uh, so they had the, a similar thing going on. Each regiment was divided into eight battalion or regular companies. Then they would have a grenadier company and a light infantry company. We talked last time about grenadiers and light infantry. Uh, grenadiers were kind of your bigger, tougher guys. Originally, they were founded to uh, primarily throw grenades around. But then over time, they just kind of became – they're kind of like heavy infantry. And then the light infantry is the exact opposite. Those would be people moving quickly, not having as much equipment. So, again, within each regiment, you had eight regular companies and – a grenadier company, and a light infantry company. So that would be a total of 10 companies. The company would have about 60 to 100 men, and they were commanded by a captain. A regiment was usually commanded by a colonel. Uh, let's see. And they also have cannon in there too. Um, artillery worked into each regiment. Artillery were not separate units. And let's see. Yeah, light infantry were used, back to the idea of light infantry, they were used kind of like as skirmishers or scouts. They would go out ahead of the main body and just kind of scout out, see what kind of obstacles might be on the ground, try to get some idea of the enemy disposition. Were they fortified? Were they dug in? Did they? How many were there? Where exactly were there? Things like that. So we saw uh, in the... Battle of Lexington that light infantry and grenadiers had gotten detached from their regular units and were sent out and kind of all mushed together with other light infantry and grenadiers. So that was an interesting situation. That's part of why they were not as effective as they might have been because they were under new commanders and they hadn't worked together and things like that. So that's the basic organization. Yeah. And speaking of commanders, going back to that Napoleon quote that the British army was an army of lions commanded by jackasses. Does that have something to do with the training of enlisted soldiers and then also the leadership of officers? Is he saying that the training is effective or the men are hardy and brave, but the officers are just these foppish dandies who fall into the office? Or what do you think is uh, going on there? Before I get into officers, uh, let, we'll talk a little about training. Now, the British Army was a professional army. These guys were well-trained, well-trained. 
serious professional soldiers. They trained in their regiment. Now, the training was mainly drill, so it was mainly.